Hello and welcome to this lecture about wireless network security. In this lecture, I'm going to talk about the security of uh, wireless networks and uh, in particular, one type of wireless network, which is the Wi-Fi. As you know, there are many types of wireless networks, cellular technology, um, and also um, Bluetooth, Zigbee, Z-Wave, uh, and many others. So I'm going to focus my uh, lecture here on the IEEE 802.11 set of standards, which are collectively known as the Wi-Fi. The Wi-Fi networks are the dominant technology for creating wireless LANs or WLANs. And um, they are increasingly become the primary technology for connecting uh, or for, for access technology, for connecting all kind of nodes from desktops, laptops, uh, sensor network, uh, sensor devices, uh, uh, all kind of um, nodes. So it's a dominant technology and therefore um, it's uh, worth considering the security of this type of networks. So the main components of the wireless LANs are the access points uh, and the client devices. The client devices, of course, can be any number of types, any number of devices. <clears throat> and let's, let's not forget also other components uh, which are not mentioned in this slide, like the antennas and the, the shape of antenna has a big uh, or has a contribution in the the way the um, electromagnetic signal is uh, propagating through the space through the air um, so that's a significant part or significant component of the wireless LAN as well um, and we'll get to this uh, later on so um, when you look at the wireless networks one thing you notice at, at from the beginning that they are um, uh, they have a high risk um, of, a, of intrusion than wired network why because we don't really control the propagation of the, the electromagnetic signal the same way we control the the access to wired network um, they are, and of course, they are. They are, as I said, they are dominant because there is a low deployment cost compared to wired networks. So organizations prefer to deploy wireless networks instead of wired. The components are relatively inexpensive uh, in both sides, both in the from the from the organization point of view and also from the attacker's point of view. It's easy to you know, use inexpensive components to attack the network. Um, the main vulnerability of wireless network is the broadcast nature, right? Everybody can listen whether the, the, uh, the, uh, the signal is intended for them or not. So it's easily the, 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 the wireless networks are easy, uh, easy victim for um, eavesdropping, for example. Um, as opposed to wired network, which uh, using the switches now, it's they're they're move they moved away from being broadcast uh, uh, or or from being yeah broadcast network to mainly um, switched network where the the packet go mostly to the intended destination and flooding is or broadcast is used is a, is a, is a for limited use. Right. So um, there are also other risks, which some design flaws in the security mechanisms of the 802.11 standard, which actually um, caused some um, some vulnerabilities that can be exploited. Right. So. We're going to take a look at all of these uh, security risks and then we're going to move into how to mitigate them um, from the design uh, to the operation phases of the network. So let's take a look at the common Wi-Fi security mechanisms. 
um, from the beginning Wi-Fi network had encryption uh, included in the standard so there are there are different protocols for encryption but each one of them has uh, certain uh, strengths and later this people discovered weaknesses so we're gonna talk about encryption mechanisms used for the Wi-Fi uh, but encryption is one of the main mechanisms for securing the network and that will prevent eavesdropping and sniffing authentication is another mechanism so uh, authentication is another uh, common mechanism for security in wireless network um, un unlike wired networks all uh, clients who needs to access wireless networks need they need to authenticate um, there are also mechanisms that are similar to those that applied in wired network including uh, MAC address filtering we can limit who access the network by looking at the MAC address and create a um, maybe a whitelist only those who are allowed uh, can get in uh, of course uh, that's is not a really secure uh, mechanism because MAC filters or MAC, MAC addresses in general can be spoofed and modified uh, and also we can use VPNs full-fledged VPNs that encrypt the packet end-to-end -end. so even if it goes through uh, multiple hops through wireless and wire there we're still we can still encrypt um, we can still encrypt um, traffic using VPNs that's um, aside from the encryption mechanisms that are employed in the wireless network itself we can do something on top of that okay so from the start we had security protocols embedded in the wireless technology 82.11 wireless technologies um, so we're going to take a look at each one of these security protocols and then identify the main weaknesses uh, main features and main weaknesses as well right so the first protocol uh, was called wired equivalent privacy protocol or WEP the WEP encrypts the data uh, using a simple shared key between the access point and the uh, client which is the laptop or the phone uh, typically using uh, 10 or 26 hexadecimal so that's 10 multiplied by 4 so that's 40 uh, or up to 1 uh, or 1 and 4 bits uh, key the key is combined with uh, initial initialization vector IV to generate uh, RC4 key for data encryption. All right. um, the algorithm itself is is a type of a stream cipher. So the stream ciphers, if you go back to the cryptography lessons, uh, what happens is um, you can generate the stream cipher, and you use that stream to XOR it with the data so you, what you get is an encrypted I'm gonna explain this in detail um, so the idea is uh, this is the basic idea of the WEP so let's visit the RC4 stream cipher and how it works and before before I do that uh, let's revisit some of the information we learned in cryptography so in cryptography and more specifically in private key cryptography we can have an algorithm that encrypts the data we use a key the data comes so we'll call this the plain text to represented by P um, the algorithm uses the key to generate ciphertext if um, the plain text is large then what we can do is use we chop the data into pieces and each piece we uh, pass it through uh, the uh, encryption 
the plain text can not be greater than the key so if the key is 40 bits so the plain text has to be block of 40 bits right um, so imagine a big file you have to divide into 40 bit blocks and then do that another technique a common technique is to use a cipher uh, uh, is to use a, a stream right what we call a stream cipher so how does this work okay instead of encrypting the plain text itself we can take um, initial vector a random number the random number can, is encrypted with the key and what happens what comes out is some sort of um, encrypted random number right that encrypted number the random number can be taken back to the encryption algorithm same key again and it encrypted again uh, so we'll call this C double prime here and the same process is repeated multiple times that's we'll do this over and over multiple times until we get a long stream of bits A long stream of bits this is what we call the stream cipher the stream cipher is generated once using the key and the initial vector right and once we generate this stream cipher what we can do um, is to um, encrypt uh, XOR it with the data so we have a plain text we will XOR it um with the cipher and what we get is the uh, the encrypted so maybe i'll change the terminology here notation i mean and just uh, use something like s for stream cipher so we'll call this s1 s2 s3 so the 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 plain text is xored with the cipher and what we get the stream cipher and what we get is the cipher right uh, and the advantage of this is that i can use the stream cipher over and over and over um, and it's make the process a little bit faster right um, if i change the initial vector i can generate a new cipher so the cipher is generated maybe once and then it applied over and over right so this is the basic idea behind the stream cipher that uh, uh, the rc4 algorithm that uh, wep uses right so with a little bit of changes so the initial vector is a random number uh, this is generated for each packet right the key is the key that we we uh, the key is shared key between the client and the access point so that is the same right if we use these both of these um, we can generate uh, this bit stream and then we can take the packet XOR it with the bit stream with the data stream and we generate the cipher text here you see that we before um, we add integrity check by using this ICV which is the integrity check which is basically a, a form of CRC right uh, cyclic redundancy check the same or same technique similar technique that we use to uh, check for errors in Ethernet frames for example okay so that's uh, that's the basic idea um, and this is again you take the data you XOR it with a stream um, it's supposed to look random the stream you get the cipher stream you send it over the channel and you do the reverse process if you take the same stream and XOR it again you get 
the idea the the, the original I, that data back right so this is how you encrypt and decrypt the weakness of this is that the uh, the initial vector itself is um, not very long which means that it can be uh, subject to brute force attack right you can you can generate different random numbers uh, until you finally get one that works uh, and sometimes even worse the 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 initial vector itself is used so w because you are sending thousands of packets so at some point you start reusing the same the same number again maybe after few after not few but many packets it starts to appear again um so what is the what is the issue here is that um, both of these can be used to recover the key very easily right um one thing is you can try to use the same uh, try to uh, a brute force attack to to detect de detect the initial vector right and also um one thing that the problem with the stream cipher is that if you take uh, let's say um, this one here this the cipher is the result of the plain text uh, XOR with the the, the stream cipher if you take that C right and XOR it with the stream cipher again or let's see it's a uh, um, let's see uh, you don't need you don't know the stream cipher initially but let's see you have a plain text message you um, XOR it with the stream cipher you generate a cipher right and let's say there's another another packet uh, that you generated by taking the plain text p2 uh, with the same stream cipher you generate another cipher here if you if an attacker holds take hold of these two which are encrypted packet and um, XOR them what happened this is equivalent to uh, P1 XOR with S XOR again with P2 with S one property of the XOR is that if you XOR a message with itself what you get you get zero right so these two cancel each other and what you get is a plain text XOR with another plain text so that means that um, from cryptography lessons, we know that if you um, encrypt the message with another message, not a random number or not close to a random number, but another message, you subject your traffic to analysis attacks, right? So they can be discovered. So you never um, XOR or you never encrypt a message with another message you have to encrypt a message with something that's very close to random as random as possible and the more random the more secure your uh, inc the, the, your XOR operation in this case so this will be subject to an analysis and eventually uh, it can be broken um, another type of attack uh, that is easily uh, done using this type of cipher is that if I have an idea about what the plain text is right so I how do I know what the plain text is well some of the packets are well-known packets like, let's say I see an ARP uh, request an ARP request is very well known it has a very well known structure and if I know where it's coming from then I probably know how, what the fields are so in this case the cipher will be encrypted with a packet 
that I can generate the hacker can generate a plain which is a plain text what happened is this is equivalent to packet uh, XORD with the stream cipher and XORD with the same packet again the plain text again so these two cancel each other and what we get is this the stream cipher once I get this one then I can break all of the encryptions I can take any cipher uh, XOR it with S and I'll get the plain text so these are the weaknesses of the WEP um, so it was discovered early on that this is not really a good uh, protocol and they had to do something about it they have to change it another uh, issue with uh, WEP is the authentication spoofing um, which uh, allows some unauthorized um, client to access the network all right so let's see we have a short length of the IV which makes it makes the pattern after a while repeatable especially when we see thousands of packets in a network we can use the uh, initial vector again and we can we can uh, do statistical analysis and we I can also as I said we do some uh, cipher recovery using these techniques okay so after a while the WEP is considered obsolete and they had to replace it with something stronger the solution was the temporal key integrity protocol or TKIP the main reason behind the TKIP is that a lot of the protocols a lot of the security protocols are actually implemented in hardware so the data comes from your laptop goes to the network card the network card applied this encryption because it it, it uh, the card uh, uh, offloads some of the processing from the software right so it wasn't easy to say WEP is not good let's replace all the cards out there so it was that that wasn't practical so the practical solution is to have a, some kind of a, a, a mitigation some added layer of software that fixes some of the problems was while the network card itself still uses WEP so this is what the temporal key integrity protocol is the enhancements were uh, first of all we use dynamic key generation so the keys that uh, remember the IV is replaced uh, every packet but the key itself is fixed in the WP here we change um, the keys so which means that the key that you share with the uh, with the access point is not being used directly instead we use it to generate other keys that we can use uh, for every packet and the other uh, enhancement is per packet key mixing so the 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 encryption key the initial encryption key or sometimes called ptk um, it, uh, it it generated by mixing few things together so this technique the per packet key mixing is what uh, gives the name temporal key integrity because this key the 48 bit uh, packet key is what keeps changing for every packet and then another enhancement is the message integrity check uh, instead of using something plain text like CRC uh, which can be faked uh, if you want if, if somebody can change a message uh, or a part of a message they can also change the the CRC so um, but if you use message integrity check which is you generate the checksum and then you hash it so now um, that's not going to be um, ev uh, 
and hash it and encrypt it so it's not going to be a, a, a possible for the hacker to change the mic which means that you can uh, get a better integrity check also sequence numbers are used so that uh, you cannot replay the packets or so each packet will have a sequence number if you replay the packets then the sequence number will appear again so uh, the sequence number will prevent the replay attacks um, so the protocol is not a, a perfect solution uh, it was a temporary solution and it's still considered a weak and eventually people discovered uh, vulnerabilities including uh, the, the, the weakness in the key mixing process itself um, similar to WEP you can actually see that there are some small packets have a well-known structure so the the header is known so you can generate um, a plain text packet and that will be your and you will use you will know what the what uh, and if you know uh, if you have the encrypted packet and the plain text packet you will be able to find the key and also you will be able to generate some kind of a packets arbitrary, arbitrary packets in the in the network so you 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 cause uh, problems with the network um, limited key length is also an issue um, 128 bit key is not by today's standard is not robust enough you need longer uh, keys so moving on we get to the Wi-Fi protected access or WPA the WPA has three versions the original and two and three uh, the WEP uses pre-shared key um, but you can also use um, radius I think it where the slide here says WEP but I think it's WPA the WPA employs a pre-shared key and we can also use some kind of authentication server like radius we use also part of this protocol is the a22.1x which is an authentication protocol that can be used for wired and wireless networks as well um, there is also something called uh, in WPA2 uh, we can use four-way handshake process uh, to establish encryption keys without actually passing those keys across the wireless channel right which guarantees that um, nobody's gonna sniff these keys and the algorithm itself for encryption is the advanced encryption standard which is much stronger than previous algorithms like uh, DES um, so um, the WPA can go back and fall back to TKIP if the A A AES is not available so we can it's you can consider it you can use WPA2 for with the advanced encryption standard or with the TKIP so let's take a look at the four-way handshake um, initially the client will say they they start the association process where the client wants to um, access the wireless network or join the wireless network so the access point reply with information including that okay I can support WPA2 if you want to so the client requests the authentication and the 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 uh, access points reply saying okay I'm ready so both start the four-way handshake so the client the access point actually sends a random number it's called um, um, DA stands for uh, applicant uh, nonce to the client the client 
response response with a random number called um, supplicant nonce and a message integrity check value right uh, which is derived um, by certain things including the pre-shared key uh, between the client and the access point the AP verifies the MEC and sends its own MEC value and something called encrypt, uh, group transit key which is encrypted GT, GTK the client decrypts the GTK and verifies the MEC then sends an acknowledgement all of this happens during um, uh, the four-way handshake and after the four-way handshake what you get is both sides uh, both the client and the access point have the same uh, transit key PTK this is without actually um, exchange it over the wireless channel so each one of them they derive based on this information this is by the way simplified I skipped few things but the by the by the end of this four-way handshake both they will get the same key similar to the concept to Duffy Hellman algorithm where they both sides exchange information and both sides derive from that information they derive the same key okay? and also both of them they get this G TK, uh, which is uh, used for encrypt, both are used for encryption and decryption. But the GT GTK is used for multicast and broadcast, while the PTK is used for unicast. Um, so that's also uh, that's more secure. While the GTK is shared by multiple clients. Okay, so moving on. Um, let me see if there is anything that I skipped here yeah I think I realized that I, uh, I I think I said a nonce is actually authenticator nonce not applicant so the a nonce is for authenticator nonce while the s nonce is supplicant nonce okay so uh, uh, I I used the wrong uh, name before okay so with the, what is the what are the weaknesses of WPA and WPA2 um, some vulnerabilities were discovered including something called crook vulnerability and this vulnerability can allow attackers to inter intercept and decrypt data under certain conditions um, and also um, there is the PSK mode is vulnerable to dictionary attacks so these these keys can be discovered by just uh, they have a, a compiled list of uh, potential passphrases and then they'll try them one by one until they figure out which one is used um, so uh, that's a weakness and that's a weakness like uh, think about it when you are using a shared key with you and the client right? uh, with you and uh, you are the client and you are sharing you're using a shared key with the access point uh, shared key is like any other password if you are using you know, password one two three um, well then that's not a, a really good password so the attacker may have a a big dictionary of all the people all the kind of password that people think of and just use it um, to maybe find one of those are being used in the network in some cases um, key management practices are being employed and that will lead to uh, weak to vulnerabilities right so you don't use the password the strong password or you use the password over and over again so you use the password for months and then or a couple of months and then you change it uh, for another couple of months and then you go back to the first one right so you are not really uh, you are you're, you are replaying the same passwords just um, over a, a longer period so that's also weakens the security 
Another one is the attack sometimes comes from the inside, from the people who know. So if you are, you, if you have a client who ha, who has the password, who knows what the password they're using in the in the network, so that actually increases the risk because they can use this knowledge to. Well, you have one one uh, one ingredient, so to speak. Uh, to break the security of this network so they can use that one ingredient to combine combine it with other ingredients to uh, eventually um, threat the network right or introduce a vulnerability uh, one of these is uh, called uh, vulnerabilities called whole 196 vulnerabilities both crook and whole 196 are available in the material related to this course so you can look them up Okay, the last protocol in the Wi-Fi is the WPA3. Uh, it was introduced in 2018, so um, uh, it replaces WPA2, of course. And it uses something, uh, it introduces uh, several enhancements. One of them is a new key establishing protocol called simultaneous authentication of equals or SAE so rather than using the pre-shared key which has been used all of on all of these protocols in some form or another then we have something diff totally different so the SAE prevents offline brute force attacks and offer forward security secrecy forward secrecy means that if somebody breaks the, the, the uh, encryption now that doesn't mean they're gonna uh, be able to decrypt previous messages. So you, the hacker, by the time they find the way to find the key and decrypt the packet, the 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 uh, the keys are already changing in the future. So that means that you always, for them, um, discovering the key means that they're not they may go back a little bit but they're not gonna go forward actually even going back uh, they can't because the key keeps changing so that's what we mean by forward secure secrecy in general it also introduces something called opportunistic wireless encryption or owe for encryption in open wi-fi if it's an open then you probably are not sharing any keys right so what does that mean there is no encryption well this protocol will encrypt the packet even if there is no even for the open wi-fi which does not require you to register or do anything um, so that prevents or secures the data without passwords and prevents any eavesdropping or man in the middle attack uh, it supports 192-bit encryption, which is longer than the 128 we have seen before. Um, introduces something called Device Provisioning Protocol, DPP, which allows password-free device connections with a QR code or NFC tag or Bluetooth, right? So that will allow you, and you probably see this sometimes in uh, uh, in allowing your phone to access uh, a smart device like a, a plug or a thermostat or something like that so um, that that probably uh, being used without without using a shared key the WPA3 is backward compatible with WPA2 so this means that if you have a WPA2 device uh, and the access point supports WPA3, then you are okay. You are still you you can still connect. Um, however, um, well, not however, but the good news is this protocol is being mandatory for all Wi-Fi devices certified after July 2020. So it has been three four years now. So it's unlikely to find a device that is not supporting WPA3 unless you have something old, older, uh, older than 2020, July 2020. Uh, so it's uh, uh, very likely that any 
device you're using modern device it will be it will support the wpa3 and all these functionalities in it so all of those are protocols that are being used to uh, to to uh, encrypt the data uh, this protocol i mentioned it before and was there since the beginning uh, or since wpa um, it is iterably a22 dot one x the main purpose of this protocol is authentication whether it's wired or wireless so the idea is uh, you plug the device into a switch before the device can send any packet it has to authenticate first so the packets allowed only for authentication purposes and nothing else until the authentication process is done for wireless same thing if you use this in the background for authentication then the access uh, the client will not be able to join the network until it's being authenticated so this has been around since wpa and uh, it's part of the uh, a22.11i standard right so it's part of it and the a22.11i standard is for the security in the .11 networks. Um, this, ex this slide explains the architecture. Um, so you have the authenticator. You have the authenticator is the uh, something like a radius server, right? Or TechX plus or any um, AAA uh, servers which serve for authentication authorization and accounting um, so this is in the background it can be in any anywhere in the network the authenticator the supplicant is your device your wireless device in this case this is actually wired network not wireless but the same idea um, this printer needs to authenticate so the authenticator here the, the authentication server is in the background the supplicant is the machine that wants to authenticate the authenticator can be the switch the switch itself right um, so and it it could be your access point if we're talking about uh, wireless network so the client mm -hmm. Uh, let's see the supplicant in this case we call it the supplicant is the device that wants to access the network it initiates the authentication process the authenticator is typically a network switch or wireless access point that acts as intermediary uh, intermediate intermediate uh, <laughs> I cannot pronounce this word apparently um, uh, so it's an intermediate point let's avoid the uh, pronunciation altogether and uh, this is the, the authenticator enforces the access control so it basically um, um, forwards the message from the uh, supplicant to the authentication server if the authentication server says okay then the authenticator say fine you can go in if not then the the switch will just shut off the port or prevent any pre any packets from passing uh, the authentication server uh, can be radius can be ldap server or any type of authentication server okay. so this technique can be used and if you go back uh, to the previous slide you see that it has been implemented since wpa okay uh, another technique um, that um, maybe we'll call it authentication, not really, it's the MAC filtering. So the MAC filtering restricts access to the Wi-Fi network based on the MAC address. Um, a lot of um, access points right now, even, uh, even the cus uh, consumer level, so these are the ones that you can buy from local stores, they can come with some kind of mac filtering so you can use them to specify which macs are allowed in a home network for example you know your mac devices so you can just all put them in 
in your access point so you prevent the neighbor from access your network for example or some somebody from the outside so that's uh, uh, an easy uh, mechanism to filter and control who access your network using Mac right uh, Mac by Mac filtering by itself is not um, um, foolproof. It can the Macs can be uh, spoofed. Anybody can change the Mac address on their devices. So they're not they cannot be used as the only mechanism. But you can use them as another layer of security. Yeah? Uh, they are time consuming because you need to update. The list every time there is a change in the network somebody leaves somebody comes in so um, it, they are not convenient um, okay so we talked about encryptions and in the process of talking about encryption I also talked about the weaknesses of the security mechanisms that we talked about all of them right uh, so let's talk about other security risks here that uh, result from the nature of the wireless network itself. So the wireless network emits radio signals in omnidirectional patterns, generally speaking, right? So this means that they can go beyond the physical boundaries of the space that they are in. So if you are installing an access point in the room you don't expect that well the the signal will just stop conveniently at the room the 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 walls of the room they're gonna go leak outside right and if you are in a in a multi-floor building then they're gonna leak on the top floor and the bottom floor as well so omnidirectional antennas these are antennas that they send signal in a sphere so everywhere so if you are in in this level um, it's in the ceiling of one level uh, the top level here they will be able to um, get the signal and also maybe the level below you can also get the signal as well so you are not um, the the propagation of the access point is not bound by the physical boundaries of the building they can go outside okay so this means that somebody who's sitting outside the building can receive the signal can um, sniff the traffic can apply all of these rules to figure out the key uh, do analysis traffic analysis do all kind of uh, uh, attacks from the parking lot from the outside and this is why we call it the parking lot attack where the user physically the hacker physically outside the building but they can still get the signal and they can be conveniently sitting in a public space nobody's bothering them because they are in a public space but they can use all kind of tools that allow them to monitor the wireless network traffic intercept traffic maybe even save it so that they can uh, decrypt it later right um, so uh, this is one of the main um, risks in wireless network Another risk is the rogue access point. The attacker may install uh, an access point um, inside, outside the building, somewhere hidden, maybe you don't see it. And the only thing that they need to do sometimes is just allow the power of the access point to be, to be higher than the, uh, the existing access point. So if somebody in a really bad coverage, bad spot in the network and they see access point, the original, the, the legitimate access point have a low power. And then there is this access point where it has fantastic the, uh, signal. So they're going to connect to the rogue one. And by connecting to the rogue one, 
uh, this simply creates a man in the middle attack the the rogue access point all the traffic will go through it so now uh, any traffic will fall victim to the hacker the hacker will use this information the packets to do all kind of stuff that are that is associated with man in the middle attack right decrypt capture uh, replay all of this because all of the traffic is going to go through them um another type of risk is denial of service uh the network security the wireless network is open it's broadcast nature um anybody who's outside the building uh, can simply generate a lot of traffic that go into that network and even if it's not directed to any uh, device so maybe just to access point or just by the nature of sending packets through the same uh, to the same through the same channel you are preventing everybody else from communicating remember uh, from the lessons of wireless um, if the access point um, is talking to a client a packet is sent during this transmission nobody else can speak right it's uh, it's um, half duplex communication kind of thing right uh, for the most part so as long as there is somebody is talking to the access point nobody else can talk to the access point if somebody maliciously starts sending packets a huge amount of packets you overwhelm the network another type of attacks is what's called the de-authentication attack so by the end of the legitimate communication between the access point and the client the access point or the client can send uh, a packet let's say it, it, it's called um, de-authentication packet and uh, these packets are used to end the Wi-Fi connection so uh, you know that the the connection is terminated and that's it the attacker can send forged fake the authentication frames uh, so it can pretend to be one client and sends the authentication frame to the access point so the access point says okay this client wants to leave so okay we are done but the actual client um, what they see is they are being kicked out of the network right they cannot go back to it if the attacker does this uh, for any number of clients they all be kicked out and this could be a leading uh, phase of something else so if I have a forged access point and I want to force all the existing clients to come to me so what I do I just send the authentication frames to force them to get out of their uh, access point and then once they get disconnected well there is this access point that's still working it's still nice and has lots of power so let's connect to it so it could be uh, a stage toward another attack uh, packet injection attacks um, you can use them um, just inject malicious packets to the network um, form of um, denial of service um, just as I said, as long as there is transmission between the client and the access point, nobody else can talk. So as long as I'm sending traffic, everybody else is going to be um, on hold. They cannot do anything. There is also a protocol called WPS. Uh, Wi-Fi protected setup which is a protocol that um, uh, is designed to allow easy connection between uh, between a client and access point or for somebody to join an access point so sometimes you see access point with a button you push it um, and it will simplify 
connecting a client to the access point without really going through the uh, setup and putting a password and all of this right so i rarely use it but it's there especially for consumer uh, consumer access points um, so if some some of these devices some of these access points have the wps enabled by default which allow people to exploit if it's something enabled by default then maybe the attackers will exploit uh, exploit this uh, vulnerability and uh, the pin numbers they they use pin numbers the pin numbers usually short right three four uh, i don't think anybody will remember six pin numbers so they will use short pin so that's easy uh, even six is easy uh, to guess in modern tools right and using automated tools that will make makes the hacker job a lot easier uh, another vulnerability is the uh, the SSID names right uh, there are actually a couple of vulnerabilities uh, that stem from the same same, same idea first of all um, if you get an access point from from the market from the store they have default setting one of them is the default setting of the ssid right for many many people they they just leave the ssid as is they don't know how to change it or they don't want to change it so they leave it as is right so now if the ssid is known to the hacker because every vendor has a default ssid built in in all their devices so now you have one of those ingredients as i mentioned before one of the ingredients to a launch an attack uh, another actually example that i noticed uh, if you get um, wireless or if you get an internet service from one of the service providers in town what they will give you they will give you an access point and that access point um 100 sure that they have uh the ssid set by default like right? so uh bell one two three right if you go around the neighborhood you will see bell one two three you will see what bell one two four and you will see all you will probably figure out not just the ssid itself but also what type of what type of device behind it because they're all getting their uh, their devices uh, or their services from the same service provider so you will know not just the SSID but what kind of vulnerability of the device behind it okay so um, you usually don't um, leave the SSID um, the same you have to change it right? another uh, ssid related is that sometimes the uh, now we're not talking about homeowners or somebody who's uh, low tech uh, but somebody in organizations sometimes the ssids are given name to indicate their purpose so we'll say accounting uh, wi-fi or engineering so the name itself indicates uh, what the SSID is for from the management point of view that's a good idea maybe because we want to identify different access points and we don't want to confuse we don't give them we don't want to give them generic names right? so AP 13 or we want to give them something meaningful that's from the management point of view but from the security point of view uh, this is a risk so now you have these two competing uh, interests you want to have a clear uh, ssid name uh, or well, well ssid name is a is a kind of a misleading because the id is called identifier so let's call them service set identifier so the ss identifier should be clear but on the other hand it should be obscure enough so that the attackers don't don't know what the purpose of the access point is right so keep that in mind 
Um, and also, we have seen another risk, which is all the risk that we talked about in the previous slides, exploiting all of these vulnerabilities in the protocol. So these are all the kind of risks that we talked about, security risk for the Wi-Fi. Okay, so how do we secure the wireless LANs? We can secure them in the three phases of the life cycle of the of the LAN. So the, any network starts by designing the phase. So we plan the network, we design it first, then we build it, implement it, and then we operate it. So we're going to take a look at securing the network in all these three phases. So that in the design phase, we want to make sure that a network is designed properly to mitigate against the parking lot attack, for example, if I'm designing a network in this space, right, designing a wireless network, and I put an access point here with omnidirectional antenna, what will happen, right? Um, so this is a top view, right? So this is the top view of the building, and the sphere will look like a circle here. So only 25% of the signal is propagated within the space that I want, while the remaining 75% is outside, right? So maybe I'll design the wireless access point to be more contained. Or if that's not possible, I may design uh, the access point so that the antenna itself is, instead of omnidirectional antenna, I'll use directional antenna, right? Directional antennas are, uh, their signal is concentrated towards um, a, sing, uh, a certain angle or a cone rather than a sphere. So now I mitigate the risk. That happens during the design phase, of course. So I control the signal propagation using different types of antennas. Another, uh, thing that I can do in the design is to separate the wireless from the wired. Usually, all wireless networks end up connecting to the wired. Uh, so in the back, the access point needs to be connected somehow to some wire, wired network here. So uh, instead of connecting it directly, I may need to put a, a firewall here to separate between the two uh, uh, pieces. And we saw that when we talked about uh, zoning in the network and separating different zones. So we talked about putting a firewall between the uh, two, any two networks with different risk levels or different security levels or different trust levels. So it's always recommended to put firewalls between the two. In smaller networks, the Wi-Fi access point itself may have some kind of a filtering capability, packet filtering capability, so we can use that as well. Although the risk here is this access point itself has to be uh, properly uh, secured, otherwise people will just steal it, right? Or uh, hack into it and change the, the filtering. Uh, Firewalls could or should block, uh, block our broadcast ICMP scans coming from the wireless network to prevent attackers from discovering any, any network in internal network that's behind the access point. Um, so I talked about limiting the signal propagation, so use omnidirectional, uh, use directional antennas instead of omnidirectional antennas and manage the propagation well. Another thing that I can do uh, to secure the network is to segment the access point coverage area. Um, what I mean by that is, in a scenario like this one, uh, maybe I need, maybe I can, uh, I can use one access point to um, cover the entire space. And by cover, I mean provide 
enough signal strength so that all the nodes all the mobile devices or all the wireless client inside this room will be able to connect or inside this building will be able to connect all right but that means that if this access point is subject to the denial of service attack ddos or dos what happened everybody is going to be affected all the devices all the clients going to be affected so as an alternative technique i can design this network to uh, limit uh, instead of having one access point that serves everybody i can have a number of access points and each one of them will have a smaller coverage area and if one access point is um, being attacked the others will still serve the rest of the clients so you limit you limit the damage in other words segmentation has many benefits not just for security but also for the design in general because the the, the less clients for access point the more bandwidth each client will get so it has it has it has benefits as well and because there's enough bandwidth so even if there is a denial of service attack it will not consume all the bandwidth and you still have some bandwidth left for other clients you may see degradation of course but not total uh, not total disruption uh, in the deployment phase so this is the phase where you're actually implementing the network not in the operation yet you finish the design but you want to you want to configure the access point and deploy them um, so in the deployment phase what do you do you you actually install the devices you configure them you uh, uh, assign channels you adjust the power so all of this will happen during the implementation uh, and also there is an overlap between these phases by the way so there is no sometimes there is no clear cut between one phase or the other so uh, you can see some of these maybe you can do them in the operation or you can do them in the design so if you want to if you want to install an access point the access point itself is um, is um, exposed right uh, uh, if you are putting it in a in a open space somebody may go and steal it it's not like a switch which is always in a cabinet room and locked behind a closed door access points usually are exposed especially if you are put them, putting them outdoors altogether so they are more likely or more susceptible to theft um, so theft means that two things right you're losing money uh, you are uh, now the wireless network is not available because you are losing components and also that the what the theft of the wireless could also lead to more attacks so if somebody goes and steal the wireless access point and then log into it at the comfort of their home and figure out your security policies your past shared password they may use this uh, information to hack the act the active network the production network later on so there are multiple risks that come from from stealing the equipment themselves so to prevent stealing the equipment you want to secure them physically right in spot in in space don't put them behind cages because cages would prevent the access they will prevent the propagation of uh, 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 of the signal of the uh, of the uh, electromagnetic signal so you don't put them behind uh, a net uh, which is sometimes a, a common mistake people do uh, but you need to secure them somehow um, you cannot also put them uh, 
on top of a false uh, false ceiling so again for you so it's a it's a tricky thing and there are actually access points that are designed so they cannot be easily uh, stolen this way just by un unscrewing some screws right? um, also in the configuration you avoid excessive coverage of wireless networks so you put the proper you design them so that you can um, you put them in a proper space and as i mentioned in this picture here you limit the propagation uh, of the broadcast so people outside don't get the don't get the signal Uh, it's always recommended that you don't use the full transmission power. Always a good idea to limit the transmission power and the RF signal um, to to uh, to to enough so that you can have enough coverage to your clients. Hardening the access point. So the access point itself, you can. Uh, the term hardening means that we secure it in many ways. Uh, one way change the default configuration setting so people don't don't use the default SSID right? uh, change the default to something else that's not by itself is not gonna secure it some people will some uh, access point allow you to hide the SSID by the way hiding the SSID is not really doesn't really provide a lot of security uh, you may not see the SSID in your phone or your laptop it does not display but if you are if a hacker sniffing the traffic sniffing the packets they will see the SSID so hiding it it doesn't it's not really um, good security measure so don't rely on hiding the SSID uh, it may deter some people who are playing around maybe the neighbor uh, who wants to access your network without your knowledge maybe deter them but it's not gonna deter a hacker um, so but generally speaking change the SSID to make it something not not clear um, and, and only you know what it means uh, change encryption keys again if you have a a large uh, group of users um, enforce a policy that changes the password periodically uh, use strong you uh, unique administrative passwords these are the administrative password to log in to the access point itself or if you are using a wireless controller to access the controller and all of the access points so use strong policy strong passwords for that disable all unused management protocols again this is hardening the access point itself so the access points can be logged in using telnet using ssh using http you you could uh, snmp you could access it in man many ways if you don't need a specific management protocol disable it the protocols that are disabled cannot be used by hackers right activate logging features this is for accountability so log everything uh, access to the access point um, for example so anybody who's accessing the access point will know when and and uh, uh, how long they have been using or accessing the access point and also enable inactivity timeout so if somebody logs in and rather than leaving the session open and they go do something else after a while you should automatically or they should be automatically logged out after certain 30 seconds without any activity for example they are logged out these are gener generic uh, uh, generic um, recommendations that go for everything not just access point with the exception maybe for SSID everything else is generic you can use it to harden network equipments in general um, 
so use non-suggestive service set identifier or SSID. So accounting fourth floor, for example, is too obvious. Anybody who's walking around would know what that is. So that means, oh, this is an accounting access point. Oh, let's let's hack it because it seems like it's uh, really important. So uh, changed it to something. There is a struggle between the requirements of network management and the requirements of network security. So accounting fourth floor is really good descriptive uh, SSID for network managers because it tells them exactly where the access point is. And uh, so that's good. But from the security is not good uh, idea. So you have to find the middle ground somewhere. Uh, disable the ad hoc mode. Um, if you haven't, if you don't know, uh, Wi Fi has an ad hoc mode. So, not necessarily that the, the clients will talk to access point, but the clients can talk to each other as well without an access point. So, you can have ad hoc mode. The ad hoc mode is not supported by all the operating systems. I think Windows supported it for some time, but then newer versions of Microsoft Windows, they don't support it. Uh, but there could be some operating systems out there that allow you to create an ad hoc mode, uh, Wi-Fi ad hoc mode. If that's the case, then disable it, right? Don't allow it. Uh, because there is no need for it unless there is a specific very specific reason for having an ad hoc mode most likely you won't need it disable it um, because in in most cases the clients don't want to talk to other clients a phone there is no need for it to talk to a phone right um, they usually the wireless access point will allow clients to access a server access a certain service in the wired network so mm -hmm. most of the traffic needs to go from the client to somewhere in a wired network right? uh, even without ad hoc mode they you may see some communication between a client and another client in the same cell in the same SS uh, service set so generally speaking also there is no good reason for it uh, and it may indicate or if you allow it then a hacker can jump from one client to another within the access uh, within the access point within the cell wireless cell until they find somebody who is compromised who has uh, a weak security in their laptops or in their device or maybe they use it to uh, spread malicious software so in your security policy prevent communication between a client and a client so if the client if the source traffic comes from uh, a wireless client the, uh, do not allow it to go to another uh, to a destination uh, client who is in a wireless network. So allow only wire to wireless communication. Uh, and even that, as I mentioned before, you put a firewall. Um, security patches have to be kept up to date. This is the, all the security, uh, all the software and the access point itself needs to be updated so it keeps uh, updated with the or removes any vulnerability that appears in in the in the software itself and uh, if you have mac address filtering okay so you could use it as well um and uh, this is probably in, uh, maybe more of an uh, operation phase rather, rather than deployment phase, but we will use it as here as well. So use wireless intrusion detection systems or WIDS. Wireless intrusion detection systems, uh, they detect anomalies and they alert the administrator. So one anomaly is if you have 
uh, a client talks to another client this could be a suspicious activity why two clients are talking to each other so you may actually use an ids to alert the user to something unusual or maybe if there's a unusual increase on of, of the volume of the traffic so you may uh, use the ids here to alert uh, the administrator finally the operation phase so this is after you install everything you configure everything and now the network is in operation um, so how to protect the network one thing is to educate the users about the risk of the wireless technology you have to change your password regularly uh, don't walk around with or make sure that your your laptop doesn't have any viruses uh, um, and all of these things that don't share your password with somebody else all of these that uh, will mitigate any risk of using the wireless technology uh, keep accurate inventory of all wireless devices one of the risks that i mentioned earlier is a rogue device a rogue wireless access point that somebody plugs in in the network if you know that your network has x number of devices x number of wireless access point and you uh, and you keep track of these by scanning the network you scan the network every hour um, and say okay how many devices in the network and they come back always three so now you know that nobody else managed to uh, add another device if somebody added another rogue network uh, another rogue device access point now you will discover it by doing scanning um, same thing with logging and, and keeping track of all the devices in the network um, also you need to audit the logs regularly so you need to make sure that uh, whoever is authorized to do something in the in the network itself they don't abuse that authority right so you always um, you always um, keep track of what's going on in the network in the wireless network in the per in particular right so uh, all of these are the things that you need to do uh, to r reduce the risk uh, and secure the wireless networks in the design, deployment, and operations phase. With that being said, that concludes the lecture. Uh, thank you for listening, and we will meet in another lecture.